Bonjour. Uh, merci d'être venu si nombreux. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us in uh, such great numbers to, uh, for the introduction of Monumenta 2014, the uh, Strange City by Ilya and Emilia Kabakov. I must apologize uh, for uh, Ilya not being able to join us. Uh, this morning, uh, Emilia will tell us more about it. Sure. We will uh, give you an introduction to the si exhibition and then you can ask questions. Uh, this is uh, actually the largest uh, installation that Ilya and Emilia have uh, uh, organized up until now. As you know, they have uh, um, set up many installations across the world, across many museums, and they were therefore prime candidates to uh, take possession and rearrange this uh, great uh, venue of the Grand Palais. But it's not the only reason why they've done it. The fact is that they are artists which uh, who cover a broad scope of art. They have many ideas, many proposals, and uh, they cover a tremendous amount of ground. Quite simply, they are talking about life and human condition. As you know, Ilya started his work in the Soviet Union, and uh, based his work on a very meticulous analysis and observation of the then Soviet society. He was remarkably ironic in so doing because he would completely subvert uh, the principles, regulations, uh, prescriptions of uh, Soviet uh, life. In so doing, he managed to pinpoint and identify a number of social rules and principles that apply not only in the Soviet Union but in many other totalitarian uh, regimes. And that was the basis for his art. Another basic principle was a questioning of uh, painting and art. In a way, Ilya Kabakov is a questioning artist. He is always doubtful and asking questions, and that is what led to the Moscow Conceptual Art School, uh, which he led for many years. For a fairly long um, period of time, people only referred to him um, by focusing on this specific element of his art, uh, all that was related to his early years, to his uh, to the ground on which he started prior. Now, he left the country in 1987, and then he, started, he met Emilia, Emilia, and from then on, his art started being more general, uh, comprehensive, or maybe even universal. I mean, Western universal. Um, the discourse, therefore, broadens and uh, reaches out beyond social issues and freedom of expression. His art uh, starts focusing on humans and human life as such and the dreams of individuals. Uh, the dreams that they have and the dreams that they have. So, with Monumenta, with the strange city, we address all of these questions. Now, I'm sure you have the press jun the press uh, junket, uh, but I'll run you through it all the same. You come in through the nave, and uh, you see the uh, coloured sparkling of a uh, stained glass window, in a way, an upside down cupola. Uh, with more than 1,000 uh, phosphorescent tubes um, of various colors, uh, changing colors, uh, colors that change at the same, uh, in time to music. And this has a very strong uh, visual impact. 
on se dirige vers l'autre extrémité de la nef du Grand Palais, et on a un ordre après avoir passé à côté d'une ruine, d'une porte triomphale, un peu the ruins of an ancient triumphal arch. And uh, you walk in, you go through the double walls that surround the city and walk into the city, the city made up of five buildings. The first of it, of them being the empty museum. In fact, uh, you're walking into a, say, 19th century um, et euh, en fait, euh, les peintures ont été remplacées par de la musique. Et on entend euh, la passacaille de Jean-Sébastien Bach, et en fait, euh, on se rend compte. And in a way, the visual arts have been replaced uh, by sound. And there clearly is the beginnings of an, a yearning towards the sacred. For indeed, according to Ilya and Emilia Kabakov, this is the epitome of museums. Museums in our secular uh, world are, in fact, the shrines of our values. Then we have Manas. Manas is a Tibetan city, both a, a celestial and terrestrial city. In fact, when you walk into the, to the heart of uh, the, the city, uh, for after all, Manas is like the other installations, there's a heart and also a corridor around it. So at the very, in the very heart, you have a model city uh, which has uh, a copy or which is duplicated in heaven, and no one really knows which of those two is the copy of the other. Then uh, there are, in fact, eight mountains surrounding it, and at the top of these mountains, there's a venue, an organism, an institution that in a way is a gateway to heaven, to uh, the metaphysical world, a way of leaving uh, our pedestrian lives. So this is the so-called mystical venue. The next uh, facility is the Center for Cosmic Energy. What you have there are, in fact, three model buildings at the very heart of uh, the center, and they have been built on uh, archaeological digs. You assume here that in the digs, uh, or during the digs, you found stone leftovers of buildings, of chalices, of aerials, in a way, that archaeologists presume uh, in enabled a very old civilization, 1,300 years uh, before the Christian era, uh, established contacts with uh, alien life. Now, the idea here is to therefore establish an institution, a laboratory with uh, aerials and antennas looking towards uh, the skies ready to tap into this and uh, collect the signals from outer space. And uh, this even enables the hypothetical tourists in the uh, land uh, to look at a screen, a screen that shows the signals and sounds that have been collected from outer space. Now, as you can see, each of these installations tells a story, and that's very typical of what Ilya and Emilia Kabakov do. Uh, each installation, every installation, is an opportunity to tell a story, and you need to uh, understand each unit to understand the whole installation. But there are always uh, drawings, etchings, and, and models to help you in the process. The fourth uh, building is uh, How to Meet an Angel's an angel. 
In fact, you have what you find here is a sculpture that, in fact, refers back to 1920s uh, constructivist uh, uh, sculpture. You have uh, uh, ladders, ladders that uh, go up towards heaven. There's this uh, uh, man going up um, more than one kilometer. It takes uh, t two days for him to get up to the top with his uh, rucksack full of uh, food stores and etc. And at the very top, he can reach out to the angel. And then in the other uh, parts of the, this specific facility, you see other installations from Ilya and Emilia Kabakov's work, including the fallen angel that they have exhibited in other uh, venues. And this is, uh, there again, a, a religious approach to heaven. And then the last uh, building is the gates. The gates, which in fact refer to well, to the threshold you have to cross when you move from one place, one venue to another. You have uh, the door, the, fra the door frame, the doors that are open. And we know, I think, that in many cultures, crossing the threshold, going through the doors, lead to uh, many rituals. I mean, after all, moving into something new will lead to change in the lives of individuals. And these gates are uh, surrounded by 12 paintings, 12 paintings that illustrate um, a gate, sometimes barely visible, out in the distance. And each of the paintings in these uh, four sets of uh, paintings show the gates at morning, noon, and night. So, so much for the five buildings within uh, the strange city. Now, people have obviously mentioned this and com commented on it by saying that it refers to utopia. But as the Kabakovs say, what is utopia? Utopia is just well, dreaming. Uh, it's what people think of when they dream of another world, another world that will be different from the one we are familiar with. Then you leave the strange city. And you come to two buildings that are even greater than the other uh, buildings, and you come to the White Chapel and the Dark Chapel. In the White Chapel, you are offered a different look on time and memory. The walls, on all the walls, on all four walls, you have small rectangles, most of them being white, uh, but some of them are illustrated, basically the snapshots of the past that the memory preserves. Uh, we can assume here that it's uh, the past, the memories of Soviet life, a life that no longer exists and that Kabakov was familiar with so many years ago. And in a way, uh, you maybe echo uh, what uh, Soviet propaganda would promote, uh, family life, holidays. So faint prints, faint images that are in fact completely overpowered by the white, the color white, which in fact is exactly what happens to each and every one of us when we remember our past. On the western, on the western wall, um, if you refer it or compare it to a church, after all it's meant to be a chapel. So on the right-hand side, you have uh, something that refers to uh, the doomsday, uh, the day of judgment, a dark fresco with three faces that appear. Then, maybe the crowning glory, in my view, of this whole exhibition is uh, the dark chapel. And uh, that's a venue for Ilya Kabakov's uh, most recent paintings. I mean, I'm sure you know that Ilya and Emilia Kabakov um, have uh, done all sorts of things. They're painters, drawers. They're, they uh, set up installations. They ha command a wide variety of techniques. But over the last few years, Ilya Kabakov um, has tended to come back to his workshop and refocus on paint. Uh, after all, I mean, coming back to painting after the period uh, of installations starting with the 1990s. So we have six enormous, gigantic paintings. And these, seeing these paintings will take you into a whirlwind of ideas. He says it refers back to 17th century Baroque uh, art. He says that he's 
in a way had enough of mud knot, that he has visited it and uh, covered it entirely. And he refers back to 17th century frescoes and to the emotions that those to be found in churches may uh, provoke. And he's trying to, in a way, copy that in his art today. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is um, basically what you'll uh, come up against uh, when we go into the facility later on. Can I just say once again that these artists, uh, the Kabakovs, uh, have a wide scope of art. They command many techniques, and they have a different look at mankind. And in a way, that's what sets them aside from many uh, other artists who have become experts, specialists, and specialize in one specific technique or one sort of art or focus on one specific idea. Some of them uh, draw inspiration from human sciences and uh, revisit constantly that one idea. But there are, in fact, very few artists like the Kabakovs who cover such a wide range of techniques and uh, so many, uh, uh, such a broad public. Emilia, you have the floor. I hope it works. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, first of all, I want to apologize that Ilya is not here. We're always together, we work together, but we also give all the interviews together. In this case, uh, I would say he doesn't feel well, but it also one of us has to work, unfortunately. Another can be here and enjoy the publicity. Uh, uh, Everybody asks us how we start with Monumenta. Monumenta was started by Olivier Kaplan, and uh, he and Mitterrand were the first who actually offered us to do Monumenta. It was four years ago, almost four years ago. We come to Grand Palais, and of course the sheer size of it, the beauty, the history, and uh, it's intimidated by itself. But the light, tremendous, blinding light, inside of the building make it very difficult for artists to do anything inside. Our solution was to close the spaces. And also it was very convenient for us because it's kind of concentrate people on our ideas and the project itself. We decided to build, in the beginning it was uh, utopian city. Why utopian city? And I would just right now, I don't have to describe everything, and that's an uh, advantage of having a brilliant curator. He can explain it better than you, and he already did it. So I can concentrate on a few questions, which uh, during all these days was mostly asked by the journalist. Uh, why not utopian city? We come from utopian society, or at least the country which in 1920s promised the world to change the world, to create the new man. Did they change the world? Uh, maybe, because the world was for many, many years, almost 100 uh, years, divided into two parts. It was hell and paradise. But obviously, the hell doesn't exist without paradise, and paradise can't exist without hell. So when the hell was broken down, the paradise also broke down. And now we don't know which one is which, and it's complete mess all around. But being a victim of such a grandiose idea, uh, which they try to implement in reality, show us one thing. We can't really build utopia in reality, maybe never. Religion teaches that paradise is possible for us after death. We don't know if it's so or it's not, but the dream of humanity always was to create it here on Earth during our lifetime. It's always ended with a disaster. So every ism, like communism, fascism, uh, socialism, even capitalism, end as a disaster or at least now in, on the breach of disaster. Maybe it's better for all of us to keep it in the realm of art, in the art world, as a dream, as a fantasy, as something which is unattainable. And the world utopia itself, it's something which means you can't realize, it's unrealizable. But then we understand that the title Utopian City, it's a little bit overused as a word utopia because everybody 
for this last 25 years, were dreaming about Utopia, were talking about Utopia, were doing a lot of exhibitions about Utopia. And we decided, you know, what the best thing will be to do is Strange City. Why strange? The projects we pull together reflect on our ideas, our fantasies, our experience, and it's not only Soviet experience, it's mostly art experience. It's experience when you go to the museum, what happened today with the museum. An experience that uh, we still consider the church sacral space, but we kind of deprive this kind of sacrality from the museums. We don't go to the museum as a sacrality of art, sacrality of culture. So we would like people to think about it. What happened to you when you enter the space of the museum? What happened to you when you look at art? What do you have to think about? What do you have to care about? Our installation is done, and this is a big project, done with viewers in mind. We want them to slow down a little bit. We now live a very fast life. Slow down, try to think, try to look at art, try to just spend your time in installation, because installation, especially total installation, does require not only your attention, but your time as well. And reflect. Reflect on your own uh, lifestyle, on your life, on your society, on the world, whatever comes to your mind. And it's multi-leveled artwork. It's taken into consideration people's intelligence, people's education, their emotional state of mind. So everybody will be able to find something he can commiserate with and he can reflect on. And we always, whatever we do, we do it for viewers. So in this case, it's not different. It's for a lot of viewers. The main problem for us was actually two problems. One, as I said, was a light, which we hope we solve. And the second was the diversity of the viewers in this uh, Grand Palais. We know that Grand Palais has different kind of viewers, a lot of tourists, a lot of sophisticated people, and it's Paris, it's France, it's a cultural uh, cradle. cradle. Uh, everybody, you know, philosophy was here, uh, poetry was here, music was here always. We know a lot of it. So, Obviously, there is a lot of very educated and very sophisticated viewers will come to this installation. So we take this into consideration as well. There is a lot of philosophical questions here, but it's a lot of a lot, very simple things like miracle. At what point of our life do we expect miracle? Do we believe in miracles? Ilya and I are not very religious. We, of course, maybe somehow on the different level of our, in our mind, hidden level of our mind, like everybody else probably, without being religious, believe in miracles. We always hope there is some miracle somewhere if, waiting for us, and that's why, uh, how to meet an angel. Uh, chapels are not religious spaces, but the music of, chap of uh, cupola and the music in White Chapel, a little bit corresponding to the church bells that is unconsciously done in the cupola, but it's consciously done in Whitechapel. Uh, that's mostly all I can say right now, because I think with the summer people I will talk later, and uh, it's always better to look at works and talk about it. I, I just want to finish like this. Ed Rusha, American artist, said, you walk into the room with art, you look at it and you say, wow. Then you walk out and you say, so what? You walk into the room of art, you say, so what? Then you walk out and you say, wow. What we expect, that the viewer will come in and they say, wow. But when they end, leave, they also say, wow. Cette exposition a été this exhibition was organized with the participation of the Russian Ministry of Culture, and I'd now like to introduce Olga Svibova, the Russian exhibition curator. Uh, it's rather difficult to figure out what I have uh, left to say, because much has already been said. 
I just wanted to add some comments to what uh, Jean Hubert Martin said. He described this total exhibition, this stranger city. From a historical perspective, where does Ilya and Emilia Kabakov's uh, world come from? Because as Jean Hubert said, as you all know, Kabakov began working in the Soviet Union. He described the totalitarian reality of the Soviet Union. He described the reality of propaganda. But at a certain point, Kabakov also uh, began involved in Sotsart. This was uh, the Russian version of pop art, which played on Soviet myth mythology. And this was subverted by Kabakov. Kabakov was always stood apart. He was representative of Moscow's conceptualist movement, which had romantic and metaphysical overtones. This is because he had special qualities, which uh, I think we don't uh, see so much today. Ilya and Emilia Kabakov's creations, after all, Emilia, well, it's said that they began working together at the end of the 1980s, but uh, their background is quite similar. In this description of this wretched land, this wretched society, in describing the society, Ilya Kabakov saw how everyone had something in common, regardless of uh, where you might live, under what social system you live, regardless of what continent you live on, you can find echoes of this today. Because Ilya Kabakov can be described in two ways. On the one hand, it's the daily grind, daily life, and this is what you see in the strange uh, city. All of the buildings have some sort of sacred refer uh, reference. Nevertheless, there's always attention to detail, attention to the everyday. There's humor. And at the same time, Kabakov's work is rooted in great Russian literature. If we mention Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Gogol, we're not only talking about the text. The text always played a big part in the Kabakov's installations. But it must also be said that problems which afflict all of us, which were already there in the 19th century, in the 20th century, how we're still facing the same issues, the same problems today. And perhaps we're more familiar with these today. We have a better grasp of them. Kabakov talks about this total control. He mentions prop when he talks about propaganda, when he says that we're like flies, because a number of the installations made by Kabakov in the late uh, 60s, from the late 60s until today, there are references to flies, and Jean Hubert Martin presented this. Uh, there are also references to angels. So this is sort of the attempt to connect these two worlds, the celestial and the terrestrial. And it's the same issue, the same question that great artists have always asked. What is art? That question was asked in the late 19th, in the early 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century. And we're still asking that question today. What does art contribute? The problems we're confronted with the fact that today we lack a certain amount of utopia. Well, the character who went up into the heavens, and here I'm referencing the installation made by Kabakov in Moscow in 1985, which is now exhibited in the Pompidou Center, this protagonist that rises to the heavens, to the sky, is also linked with Russian literature, the Russian literature to tradition, and also with scientific tradition. Because the voyage into space is 
rooted in the philosophy of federal in the late 19th century. We all know that we developed this idea of this source of cosmic energy, this idea that we could harness this energy. And this is why we have this mythical Tibetan city. But it can also be seen in Vernatsky's work, in Chizhevsky's work. We've always been interested in these great ideas, these utopias. Perhaps this is, we'll never be able to create an installation that reflects life on Earth. Therefore, we're discovering the mechanisms, mechanisms according to which humanity lives and exists. We're trying to elucidate the general rules which govern our existence. And Kabakov does the same thing with human nature through his artworks. When Ilya built this strange city together with Emilia, what he's doing is he's actually trying to ask those very same questions. So here we see light, we, see, we hear music, we see the installation, the paintings, the drawings. We're going to have concerts, we're going to have performances on the sidelines of the exhibition. And we're all asking the question, what is art? At the outset, art was part of our sacred practices. And today, we're still going back to that same question. Why do we need art? Today, it is perhaps the only way for us to establish this link between our life on Earth and life in the heavens. I personally believe that that this message is understandable for everyone, for people who speak all languages, and that's perhaps why Ilya Kabakov is the only Russian artist of the artist of the mid 20th century who won such global accolades because his language, his vocabulary is universal. And perhaps it could also be said that Kabakov is the artist that's most strongly rooted in Russian culture. These roots run deep. So I hope everyone will be able to grasp this, to understand this. Furthermore, it's important that the exhibition is taking place here in the Grand Palais, because we know that Russia was twice uh, exhibited here in the 20th century. First of all, the Melnikov Pavilion, which presented the new thinking of Russian modernism in the early 20th century. There were already discussions of transformations. And then in 1937, Russia was also exhibited at the World Fair, Soviet realism. So that was the second occasion on which Russian culture was presented and many questions were raised. So I'd like to thank you all and I hope you'll uh, enjoy the exhibition. Once again, I'd like to thank the Russian Ministry of Culture and the Department of Culture of the city of Moscow, and I'll hand it back to Jean Hubert, who will uh, moderate the questions. Thank you, Olga. Well, the floor is now open for your questions. It'll be my pleasure to answer any questions you may have, please. I wanted to ask two questions uh, for Madame Kabakova. If I understand, if I understand correctly, you've been working together since 1989. I wanted to ask uh, why you started working together. That's my first question. My second question is uh, about one of the works, How to Meet an Angel. That's the title. It might be a naive question, but have you met any angels? perhaps in an artistic sense, in the philosophical sense. And what are these angels like? Um, you never ask people once, why they get married, right? Because you understand immediately they fall in love in the romantic sense of it. 
Uh, otherwise, you always suspect something sinister. Uh, you can't ask two artists why they start working together. There were reasons, and I will keep them to myself, including romantic, of course. Uh, Angels is a different story. Of course, literature, movies, um, everything right now is full of angels. Strangely, we are at, at this point, we are at a very strange phenomenon in our culture. Uh, we become fascinated by completely different figures, and it's werewolves, and it's vampires. Before, it was heroes, where young people were fascinated by them, and they were dominating literature and movies. And these heroes were bigger than life, and, but they always were positive. Somehow, the situation switch, and now vampires are positive. They represent the culture. They have tremendous knowledge because they live longer of the culture. They are talented. They are higher, more, higher, higher moral they have than humans, and even the heroes. So how come we make such an unbelievable leap to the dark side of life? Angels represent a light side. Uh, in literature and movies, you don't even have to ask. Of course, we encounter angels everywhere. Did we encounter them in real life? If I will tell you yes, you will immediately ask somebody to commit me to a mental institution. So I'm not stupid like that. I, I will not tell you if I did. Our life is full of unexpected phenomena. Even if we believe in it or not, of course, sometimes we very logical and we always afraid to be declared crazy. So we don't, even if we have meet phenomenal things, we don't really go and talk about it. I did try, I have to tell you, once, and then somebody said, you lose your marbles. So I'm not doing it again. But we all expect a miracle. When we are young, when we are older, when we go to pass exams at school, when we expect that we, we're flying, we're traveling in a car, we hope there is somebody in a dangerous moment will come and save us. And that any time in our life, when we are desperate, we expect somebody. It doesn't necessarily be angel. Angels are bigger than life. And um, hopefully, in life of everybody, there is angel. It doesn't matter which, in which form he come, in the form of literature, in the form of uh, art, or in form of human being. You will know when you meet him. Good morning, thank you. I just have a question regarding the arrangement of the two chapels, dark and white, outside the double wall. Perhaps uh, these chapels could have been inside the enclosure. Why were they taken out? Was there a special meaning to this uh, regarding the arrangement of the various elements of the exhibit? They are the, the, the actually not in behind. The, 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 sometimes uh, the double wall, it's a corridor. It's a street. It represents the street. They are inside. They were conceived together. With the, it's, it's a part of the whole city. I'll just clarify that from the outset, the two chapels, both the dark chapel and the white chapel, were outside the perimeter of the strange city itself. From the outset, it was planned this way. They're by the end of uh, the wall, but they're actually more or less inside. They're a part of the city. And they're one of the, of the main elements of the city. Good morning. Chloe Vallette, uh, I have two questions for Emilia Kabakov. Now, you work on total installations. Do you suggest uh, that with the strange city and the Grand Palais, you have a total installation? And secondly, the strange city is, of course, very strange, but but at the end of the day, could you say that the strange city embodies a human, a person, 
all of the fears we have, all of the steps we might take? First of all, it is total installation, that's correct. And of course, yes, if we wouldn't be satisfied with what we do, you wouldn't be here today yet, and we wouldn't let you in, and definitely wouldn't let in the viewer. We never ever open installation unless it's finished and unless we're completely satisfied with the results. It has to present the atmosphere we intend to present, and we hope the viewer will get the impression we would like them to have. Uh, we want the viewer to engage completely on every level, as I said before, and that's pre-calculated by us. After all, we come from totalitarian society. We give you a choice to think, but we don't give you a choice to move. And uh, it's, um, I think it's come out well, but uh, the results, it depends on the, view, on the viewer. We'll, we'll hear about it and we'll see later. We just right now plan, we imagine, to make it reality, it's up to the viewer. Good morning, Catherine Onel, working for German Radio. Emilia Kabakova, I have a question uh, regarding what uh, Jean-Hubert Martin called the crowning glory of the exhibition, and that's the paintings uh, done by Ilya Kabakov. For you, what role uh, do the paintings play? Perhaps they are particularly important against the backdrop of the work you've done over the last decades. Ilya never stopped painting. One of the greatest misconceptions of his work is that people were thinking when he started doing installation, he didn't paint anymore. That's not true. What happened? That his painting mostly ended up in the museums and private collections from the very beginning. He put them in installations, the rest of them. And whatever he painted later, it immediately was going into private collection and the museums. And the pub public didn't see a lot of them because mostly we were doing installations for almost 26 years, more than that. And uh, painting were included in the installation. Ilya very often also said that uh, painting is not important for me, painting is dead, but everybody was saying this and that was kind of common uh, phrase at that time. Painting was important for him. He always paid great attention. The difference between what he's doing in the last few years and what he did before is, before concept dominate his artistic side, his visual side, and content, and philosophical side, um, conceptual side of the painting was more important. So the visual part as a painter was hiding behind the concept. And the viewer was seeing the concept first, and then the uh, visual part later, it was really behind the concept. What he started doing lately, he doesn't have to play the games anymore, conceptual games, but we can say the games. And uh, the visual part, the artistic part, the big part of him as a real painter come up. And of course, he is very skilled in what he does because he has professional education. He can do anything. If you go there, you see black paintings, for example. The color black is not black. It's an extremely colorful. Um, he, I can't say he's a great painter. It's up to the viewer. It's up to the art historian, curators. I'm not saying this. But you will see the real paintings and real Kabakov here. Uh, the concept is still there, but now it's a vice versa. It's a painting first, concept behind the painting. Good morning, Abnet News, Camille Millard. I have a question for Ms. Kebakova. You, Ilya was uh, born in a city which is now part of Ukraine, and your works talk about, uh, refer to utopia, humanity's utopia. And how, if they do, uh, how have recent events influenced the preparation of this installation, recent events in the Ukraine? Uh, we're not political artists. We we work in the art field, we work with the art history, and our references are mostly human, in human conditions, human feelings, but also art, historical and cultural references. Uh, it's a tragedy what's going on there, but it's, for me personally, the same tragedy which was in Kosovo, which is now in Libya, 
and every other country where people suffer, when somebody forces them into things that they don't want to do, when somebody trying to, you know, divide the country, and it's civil war starting right now. And that's what we think has to be prevented as human being. As an artist, uh, you know, it's a human question. It's a, it's a question of all of us. It's political, it's human, it will have great impact on he, Europe, on every country in the world, on every human being in the world, if it will be, if it end up in, as a tragedy. For as an artist, of course, we are, we are like everybody else. I just wanted to add that I think everyone knows Kabakov's, the Kabakov's installations. I'm not sure how many installations, uh, in how many countries it's been exhibited, but I'm referring to the sh tolerance ship, which symbolizes life and in fact the sails of this uh, ship of tolerance was made up of drawings drawings drawn by children from different parts of the world children of different ages from all walks of uh, life from different backgrounds and this ship embodying tolerance it was exhibited in Moscow in Venice in Arab countries, and I believe that this ship is, in fact, a way of answering that question, because tolerance is an integral part of art. Uh, the ship of tolerance, which is Olga mentioned just now, it's a project of our foundation. It works with children all around the world. Why it's important? It's not about art only. It's not about culture. The general concept is you have to know the culture of other people. You have to know the religious. You have to know their belief and their moral uh, trust and something. The rules of each society. If you know it, if you respect it, you can communicate. We teach children that everything can be solved without tolerance. If we respect each other, we can find solution. And that's universal, and that's very important. So children get a course on tolerance first, then they make the drawings, then we make the ship, the drawings on the ship. And children can communicate during this project, which is very important. We also have musical program, and children right now from New York, unfortunately, we couldn't for many reasons bring children from other countries. We usually bring them from Cuba, Russia, Switzerland. They play together, they work together, they communicate. They see life in other countries. And here will be two public concerts given by American children. They go to conservatory, they talk to French children, it's communication, it's knowledge, it's respect in literature, in art, and in music. That's universal. Bonjour, uh, Miriam Good morning. Miriam Boutoul from Connaissance des Arts. I have a question for Ms. Kabakova. Do you and Ilya view the strange city as a total installation as defined by Ilya Kabakov in the 1980s? Yes, it is total installation. One of the, pro we hope, one of the best examples. Right now, two best examples are both in France, in Paris, as a matter of fact. It's one in Pompidou, the man who flew into space from his apartment, another in Mayol Museum, the communal kitchen. It's early installations. But this installation as well. You walk into the installation of Grand Palais, which is a palace of fantasy and, you know, crystal palace from the beginning of the 20th century. Then you walk into our white city, you enter a completely different space. It's white. It's not supposed to be there, it's there. And we use color and we use music and we use all this construction which correspond with the architecture of Grand Palais. You will see arches, you will see the cupolas there, but it's work together. But it's a completely different atmosphere. And total installation goal is to create an atmosphere which will bring the viewer into a different realm. Then you walk into each room, each building, and that's also total atmosphere. It's like you enter a of different uh, fantasies, different uh, realities, even we could say, when some object floating in the great mist, very mystical, very strange, very different. 
In some places you can sit and listen to the music. In some places you just look at the objects and paintings. And in other you just stay, read text, think about different things. But yes, it is because of the atmosphere we created or try to create, it is completely, we can call it total installation. I have a question for the curator. In your view, what is the guiding principle, the guiding principle uh, governing this entire installation? Well, I think clearly it's the relationship between everything that is not part of daily life, uh, perhaps philosophically speaking, what is metaphysics? It's everything that's beyond the physical, the physical life. So you could use all sorts of words here, spiritual, sacred, uh, the hereafter, and so on. Merci. Uh, je... Thank you. You said earlier that Ilya Kabakov's, uh, the Kabakov's work is universal, but has global reach, but also local roots in Russia. So what can you say about uh, finding a separate home when you're not really at, at ease in the place uh, to which you've been exiled? Is that particular, possibly a third place? I would say it's a compilation of cultural experiences all around the world. It's a state of mind at the age we are, because we start thinking about life, we start thinking about death, which we didn't before. Uh, we were thinking about life, of course, obviously, but not about death so much. And white and dark chapel, it's a kind of final things where we present our today state of mind, when we more think about this thing, because a lot of Ilya's friends are already dead, and uh, he's, you know, more fragile, let's say, that he was before. And still it's about life more than it's about death, but it's totality of life experience, of cultural experiences, of all these things that come to your mind when you reach a certain point in your uh, life and your, I don't know, cult cultural upbringing, your mental state and uh, your intellect. A last question, please. Yes, thank you. I'll ask the last question. So it might be by chance, perhaps, uh, but in the Grand Palais, there's also the Bill Viola exhibition taking place at the same time. And this exhibition also has metaphysical elements to it. So with regard to what you explained already, you mentioned the entirety of the city, and I believe Viola's vision is much more individualist, if uh, I can call it that. Now, the Grand Palais, is the Grand Palais looking to juxtapose an Eastern and a Western vision of metaphysics? And perhaps uh, your vision, is it much more a collectivist vision? I believe that this is a question for Amelia uh, rather than for me. If she'll ask me, if you ask my take on it, I don't see it that way. I don't see Eastern uh, characteristics in Kabakov's work vis-a-vis -vis Viola's work, which is more Western. No, I believe that these uh, parallel exhibitions, the issues mirror each other. I don't think uh, this exhibition is harking back to Soviet life, collectivism. What I tried to explain earlier is what I believe uh, characterizes his works, Kabakov's works today, is that even though they're rooted in that time, they managed to move away, to break with the past. And the Kabakov's work now has uh, much broader significance.
but I understand how you could compare their works with the works of Viola. Thank you very much. We're now going to go and see the exhibition.